Okay, again, good afternoon. Dear brothers and sisters, happy Sabbath on this hot summer day. We thank our Father in, in heaven by his mercies in Yeshua, his Son, and his Holy Spirit. We thank him that we could be gathered together on this Sabbath day. We're privileged to be thought of worthy to come, to have the knowledge to gather before him on this seventh day, to assemble before him, to give him thanks, to offer our prayers and our songs, our thoughts to him and to each other. We share with each other. It's a privilege because we get by his mercies to be counted among the righteous. And as we persevere, we will be found worthy of the first resurrection or if even transformed caught to be caught up to meet our savior in the air last sabbath we were finishing with the first epistle of john the second chapter we emphasize in verse 18 that the fact that the anti-messiah the anti-christ the anti-messiah it was told them in the time of john in the time of the apostles one the believers were told that the anti-messiah would come the one who's against the anointed anti-anointed they were told in advance that antichrist would would be coming as a result and true to that saying as it says so now many anti-messiahs many antichrists have come therefore we know that it is the last hour it was the last hour of the nation of israel at that time it was their last time that nation was about to be destroyed not so much by the anti-messiah but because of the spirit of anti-messiah that was there prevalent in jerusalem the persecutions of the disciples was so outrageous and so all their sins just as messiah said from that prophet that was at the altar until john they would be judged for all their sins messiah yeshua said and so it was the last hour and the antichrist comes so i encourage you to look into the the history of that what happened in Jer jerusalem what were the doctrines what were the mindset what were the experiences in jerusalem during those days that during those days of the last hour and then he says in verse 20 you have been anointed by the holy one and you have all knowledge so that is something we have as we point. we need to work for we need to pray for to live in sanctification so that we could be found worthy. And again, I encourage you to look at the book of Acts with Cornelius. He went through that process. He was a righteous man. He was so righteous. And mind you, he didn't, he wasn't sealed yet, but he was such a righteous man that an angel was sent to let him know that his prayers and his alms were being answered. His alms in all the good deeds that he did and his prayers were being answered. And because he, he was now ready to be sealed, to be anointed by, by the Holy One, by the Holy Spirit, Peter was sent to him look at that and that's how the sanctification process goes it's not that we learn from the Torah and from the new covenant scriptures about the will of Elohim through his son and we get baptized and so all of a sudden we, we're sealed by the spirit no no we have to go through a process of sanctification when we are totally committed with all of our hearts as we read in Psalms 138 with all of our hearts Whatever we do is we offer our best, always full of hearts. When we come to that point, when our hearts are ready, then he, the Spirit will come, sanctify us. Then we will know all things. Then we will be able to understand all things, even as all the ancients did who were anointed. And so skipping down in verse 28, so again, we learn that an Antichrist, it, we don't need to watch those left behind movies that have it all wrong. They have an entire theological, whatever position of about what it what the antichrist was they confuse the antichrist with the beast they think it's one and the same and it's not they don't understand the um, scriptures the the antichrist is as it says in verse 22 who is the liar but he who denies that yeshua is the messiah this is the anti-messiah he who denies the father and the son point blank that's it so let's forget about all those movies about the beast and all of that that's just a mess of confusion that hollywood or whoever else e even the religious societies put out there unknowing that just causes confusion and causes society to look at this as being a silly thing these are some of the reasons why so many people as brother willard mentions many people are not believing in elohim anymore not believing in his word anymore it's because of all the confusion put out there to deceive, to lie, and to make the word of Elohim of none effect. 
So we have to know that. The Antichrist is whoever denies the Father and the Son. And as I've been doing my studies, looking at some of the things on YouTube that some of the teachers are putting out there, and I see a lot, there's a particular group, I hesitate to, to men mention the group, but you can know they're out working hard to dismiss the idea that Elohim has a Son. They're against that whole concept. They're against of the Father and Son concept of Elohim. That Elohim is one, but he has a son. They're denying that. So let's be aware of that. Let's try to move on to chap chapter 3. But just before we go into chapter 3, verse 29 of chapter 2 says, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So we don't have to worry. Elohim made salvation very easy. Yeshua is the one who suffered. He made it plain. We work righteousness in his name. We are born of him. He will make sure to sanctify us and make us a bride. All we need to do is follow his instructions. Believe in Yeshua. Have your sins forgiven. Receive the spirit to overcome and receive the spirit by living a sanctified life, set apart life. So let's proceed through chapter three. And I will do my best to read it through before making any comments or taking turns for comments. So let's go into the first epistle of John, chapter 3, to see what the apostolic teaching tells us today. What the Spirit is telling us today through his servant John. So I'll begin in your reading. Or I can have a volunteer read for us first epistle of John, chapter 3. Do we have a volunteer who wants to read out loud for us? Okay, then I'll proceed. Verse 1 of chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of Elohim. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Verse 2, Beloved, we are else children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Verse 5. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Verse 6. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of Elohim appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9. No one born of Elohim makes a practice of sinning. For Elohim's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of Elohim. Verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of Elohim and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of Elohim, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does Elohim's love abide in him? Verse 18. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, 
but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemn us, Elohim is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence. Let me read that again. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before Elohim. Verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Verse 23. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Yeshua Messiah, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandment abides in him and he in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Amen. We thank the eternal for his word through his apostle and prophet, your Canaan. So now let's go through this verse by verse. I can't tell you how many times I felt like stopping to make a comment. So I'm glad I was able to, to read through without making any comments. I was tempted to make some comments. But here goes. Chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. Or behold, as the old King James read, Behold what manner the Father has given unto us, that we should be called children of Elohim. And so we are. He has called it, and it comes to pass. It's, it's always when he declares something, it will be. It is, it is his will that the righteous should be called the children of Elohim. It's a great love as we've, we've seen expressed by Abraham's servant when he's praying, show me your steadfast love. Then when he has concerning finding a wife for Isaac, when he finds the wife he to the eternal concerning his steadfast love. And as we've read today in the Psalms, Psalm 138, but in two places, David mentions the eternal steadfast love. So through his steadfast love, we are to be called his children, the children of Elohim. And so we, we are. We don't have to stress about how the apostles and the prophets tell us exactly what we need to do. Do not love the world or the things of the world. And I was so glad that Brother Willard read that over because from the book of Enoch, we saw the same thing that John says that the things of the world are passing away. And Enoch, many, many years before that, said the same thing in the book of Enoch. Tells us the things of the world will pass away. It echoes so much the, the same in how we're not to love the things of the world. We're not to love any of its ideas, any of its philosophies. We're not to. And we are to love the Father. We love the Father by doing what is right. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So that's why the world doesn't know us. We're righteous and the world sees us as losers. They, they think they're winning. Oh, you losers, you're, you're wasting your time being goody goody two shoes or however they might want to express it. The world does not know us is that it did not know him. Verse 2, Beloved, we are Elohim's children now. So now we are his children once we are doing his will. We are his children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. So we are his children now, but there's something he has reserved for us that has not yet appeared. Enoch talks about it, right? And all the prophets talk about it. The apostles talk about it all as taught by Yeshua. Yeshua taught them all. The Logos taught them all, taught the prophets, taught his servants, the apostles, about what we shall be be, giving us hints about being shining in glory, children of, of light, literally being transformed into children that are not made of flesh and blood, but of light and things that are beyond our understanding, being made equal to the angels. So beloved, we are Elohim's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the sanctification part. Everyone who thus hopes in him. What are we hoping for? We're hoping for that eternal life. We're hoping for being transformed and becoming like him when he appears. That's the hope. 
the hope of eternal life. And for that hope, we forsake all things. We don't love the world. We, we don't care about the um, world. We know those things are passing, but we know we have an inheritance. If we purify ourselves, we keep ourselves sanctified. We walk towards holiness. We don't take one step forward and two steps backwards. We keep progressing. Some of us faster than each other, but it's okay as long as we're progressing. Some of us have 10 talents and bringing another 10. Some of us have five talents and bringing another five. Some of us have one and bringing another one. That's okay. As long as we're progressing, right? Progressing in righteousness, we're being sanctified. So everyone who thus hopes in him, hopes for that eternal life, purifies himself as he is pure. And we know that him is for male and female. Verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. That's what it is. You know what Yeshua said? Many will say, I've done this in your name. I've done that in your name. They say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you, he will say, right? So everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins and in him there is no sin. So here, two things. It tells us that he appeared to take away sins and in him there is no sin. So we know who is that him that verse 2 is talking ab about. Verse 2 says, Behold, we are Elohim's children now, and what will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, so it's not really when the father appears, but it's when the son, for the son is Elohim. He's born of Elohim. He's not Elohim the father, but he is Elohim's son. And so when he appears, we will be like him. So you in verse 5, going back, so you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And that's why he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. I don't know you. Keeping the commandments is paramount to the new covenant. It's imperative that we understand it. And when we look at the, the teachings of all the fathers after the apostles, from the first up to the second century, they all said the same thing. The whole notion of we don't need to keep commandments is a perversion from the falling away from the faith. The apostasy was setting in in so many ways that falsehood was being taught. But all the first century teachers and that the apostles established, they all taught the keeping of the commandments. So we can rest assured about that, that anything else that came in later is a perversion. We, we don't even have, have to flinch on that, to, to even wonder about that. It's just a lie that we don't need to keep the commandments. We need to keep the commandments. Verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Sinning is the transgression of the law. So no one who abides in him, in Messiah, keeps on breaking the law. And that's why our master Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to turn to that because that to me is the filter of how we are to live. In Matthew chapter 5, you don't need to turn there, but I'll, I'll go there. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Yeshua said, the Master Yeshua, the Savior said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Verse 18, to clarify what that means, because some things it's to put them to an end. Some would like deceitfully say, well, it's he says he came to fulfill them. What does fulfill mean? Bring to an end. And that, well, let Yeshua qualify what he means. Verse 18 says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished, till heaven and earth pass away. Verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20, for I tell you, Messiah is saying, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the teaching of our master Yeshua concerning the commandments. There's no way around this. So any person 
who, who would say you don't need to keep the commandments. You are a quote unquote legalist. That's the new thing. Legalist. That's from the pit of hell. That's from foolishness. It's not from Yeshua. It's not from the um, spirit, spirit of truth. And notice he says relaxes. That's another thing too. Some people I've, I've been in messianic circles where some, oh, we, we keep the Sabbath, but you know, it's the, it's, it's the New Testament now. So, you know, we go out and we buy on the Sabbath. We'll go to a restaurant. Really? Where does the Torah allow for that? Because it says you shall rest. All should rest. So the person who is selling you the food in the restaurant, is he or she breaking the commandment of Elohim? Yes, he or she is, whether he or she knows it or, or not. So we should not participate in things that are done through sin. Now, some things, of course, are beyond our control. You know what people do, but we can control what we do. And we are expected to control what we do. We do not relax Elohim's law. You know, this person who called himself a rabbi, I remember some years, I was so disappointed. I thought he would do better. I said to him, brother, I don't understand it. Some people are going out on the Sabbath to buy and, and to go to restaurants. I said, How do they do that? And to my surprise, he said he does the same thing. Unbelievable. But whoever relaxes the commandments, not just breaks them, whoever relaxes them, we're not to do that. All right, so let's continue with, um, and I'm going to try to end here so I don't stay too long. So you know that he appeared, verse 5 of chapter 3, you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin, verse 6. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who abides in him keeps on breaking the commandments. That includes all the commandments, because Yeshua said, not one will pass until heaven and earth pass away. And that is well said, because there are some commandments that has to do with our human frailties. Once we become like him, there are some things that need not apply, just will not apply anymore. So let's continue. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one he keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. This is a hint, but let's take the intent of this message. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And that's why I say when people who take mikvah, get baptized, are still living in sin, they have neither seen him nor known him. We can't say we know him and live in sin. We've not seen him either. They've not seen him. They've not received a visit from him to be anointed. Because once you receive that anointing, your heart will be changed according to the prophecies of what the Holy Spirit does in, in Ezekiel. Again, that prophecy says that the Holy Spirit will cause us to love Elohim's law and will cause us to walk and live in righteousness. And the covenant, according to Jeremiah, says, I will write my law in their hearts. That can't happen from just reading the Torah. Otherwise, why would we need a new covenant? Why would we need that? Because just reading and studying the law will not write it on your hearts, will not make you love it. Will not. That's something. It has to be the, the operation of the Holy Spirit. Once we are ready, once we are ready, once we have repented of our sins, then the Holy Spirit will do that spiritual operation of changing our hearts and minds to make us love the law, love the commandments, and to keep them. So, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. So, as he, this is as Yeshua. Through him, our righteousness will be accounted as righteousness. That's his declaration. Because he knows that whatever our weaknesses are in the flesh, the moment our hearts hate every sin, he knows without that weakness, we would be perfect. That's how that works. You understand? He sees what we're trying to do. He sees what our heart's desire is. He sees when the world puts pornography in front of us. He sees the reaction of our hearts and our minds. Do we hate what's in front of us and say, get that away from me and run from it? Or do we just say, well, you know, I didn't put it there. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm just looking. I didn't put it there. What's our attitude? See, he sees that and he judges. And if our reaction is pure and righteous and, and, and just, 
then he counts us through his son Yeshua, by his covenant, his seal. He counts us as righteous, even as he is righteous. Let me end with verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. We know Yeshua accused those who were unrighteous. He says, you are of your father, the devil. That's why John is speaking ab about him. We don't need to deceive our ourselves. We don't need to let the world deceive us. Don't let our emotions deceive us. When we see people that are practicing sin and love it, they are of the father, the devil. They are of the devil. We mustn't alter the scriptures to try to please people. We have to call it like it is. And when we see someone who is of the devil, should we hate them? No. We should try to turn them patiently as much as the eternal will open doors for us to teach them righteousness. If he closes the door, we don't force it. How do we know when the door is open? When the person's willing to listen. If the person is not willing to listen, we are told to simply move away. We don't force it. We don't force the gospel on anyone. We don't cast our pearls before any swine, lest they tear and rend us. We don't do that. So I, I stop here. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of Elohim appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So Yeshua appeared and he's destroying every work of unrighteousness. Before the gospel was being preached, like when you read what the ancient fathers wrote, how the effect of the gospel in the world and what the world was like before the gospel, you will be amazed. It's important to understand how when the ancient writers, they tell us how there were nations that had abominable practices. It was so horrible some of the things they were doing. Some of their concepts, ways of life was just horrible. It was based on victimizing others, either for sacrifice. It was horrible, so it's such injustice. But when the gospel was preached to them, how they changed, how they were converted into righteousness, the works of the devil was being destroyed. For Elohim created mankind to be made in his image, to be made in his likeness. But the devil made them into the most unrighteous, evil creatures. But when Yeshua came and his gospel was being preached, something which the Torah alone couldn't do, gospel message of Yeshua transformed lives and continues to transform lives today. And so is destroying the work of the devil. Because the work of the devil is to destroy the, is to destroy mankind. Have mankind destroy itself by evil works. So when Yeshua's word transformed the soul and causes people to change in, into loving beings, the works of the adversary is being destroyed. But not only will he destroy that aspect, he will destroy their science, their, their method of study. He will destroy their ed educational. He will destroy everything that's perverted and replace it with that which is perfect. Hallelujah. Yeshua will have the victory and so will the righteous. So I end here, dear brethren, thank you.